Lucky. I want to go to TC39 meetings. Better you than me. Yeah, you feeling too smart right now, Rick? Right, guys, Video is live. Let's just tweet it now. Welcome to the first YY Roundtable. Open to committers. Sorry for the futzing, the pre pre show futzing. I think we're ready to go now. Um, so I have up on the wiki in GitHub an agenda for today. <laughs> Um, God bless. This is, I, I don't think we're going to get through everything, so this is just going to be an ongoing agenda. The most important things we'll, we'll try to bubble up to the top and just get through as many things as possible each week. Um, and then we also have ad hoc hangouts to deal with specific technical topics that we want to deep dive into, for instance, code reviews or design reviews. So we'll continue to have those for our dedicated topics. This is more just a informal forum to discuss, you know, smaller topics and make decisions that need to be made that otherwise would just continue to not get made. Um, we traditionally also use this time to review um, pull requests that need to be approved or, or um, commented on and, and um, just talk about bugs that may be on a site but are important, so things of that nature. So if we look at the GitHub Wiki, the first thing up is demos. Um, we like to take time each week and just show off code that we've been working on that has landed that um, we want to share with everyone. So, hey, Jenny. on my screen. Can you do it from, from yours if you're connected? Are we talking about Hatch? Yeah. 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 It won't let him in. I think it's because he's not added, um, he hasn't added, he needs to add the YOI library page to his circles. If he doesn't do that, we're not able to invite him. Yeah, I don't have the option. Because we can't invite him to our circles, he has to choose us. <laughs> I don't have the option to invite anyone. I choose. So Luke, are you back? What were you saying? Uh, I was asking for the link that Ryan provided in the chat, so I'm all good. OK, good. I don't see that in my chat. Unfortunate. You, jo you joined after he posted it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Well, that's unfortunate, too. OK. There he goes again. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, so moving on to the first topic here, we've got demos. All I know about today is Jeff. So, if you also want to demo something, go ahead and add it, you know, add it to the chat, and we'll, we'll hit you up. But in the meantime, Jeff, I think you need to share your screen. Awesome. There's some people on RC say that. Um, Time zones are an issue for them. So they can watch the recorded version. So are we not seeing my screen? No, we see your screen. We just need to point to it. I can see your screen fine, Jeff. Okay, we're making it the default for now. Okay, so um, as you know from the YUI conference, I was working on the Skinner demo and a couple of the issues that came up with changing colors dynamically for skins. Um, one was the slider, because the slider is its visualization is all made up of bitmaps. 
And so that doesn't play very well when you're changing background colors and colors of other things. Um, so I worked on that a little bit and uh, took the, the DOM nodes and removed the bitmaps from them using only CSS. And then in the same CSS, I modified the end caps and the rail and the thumb, um, the thumb container without the images in it to look like a slider. So I now have a, an imageless slider that still uses all of the same um, code. So there's no changes to anything except the CSS to get this slider. And then I was able to put this back into um, this demo of uh, Skinner so that you can have a slider instantiated and uh, you can play with Hey Jeff, can you can you describe how you recreated the the thumb again? You said using CSS, not using background images, but using other properties. No, what I did is I um, made the two images, the thumb shadow and the thumb. Those two images, I made them display none, and then okay. those, two, those two images sit in a container. Uh, it's a span, and that span that I used, I styled that to look like a thumb. So you styled it with properties, not with background image. Correct. Okay. So then, as far as like skinning, uh, not color theming, but skinning to have different visual representations for the thumb and the the rail, those sorts of things. That's a a very different approach. Right, and that will okay. since I'm not touching any of the code except the CSS that's used to generate these skins, all of that stuff that was done before that lets you make it look like a video slider or a round thumb, all of that still works. OK. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. So at any rate now, you know, I'm able to uh, fiddle with colors on this and, uh, and I don't know if you can see the slider changing color or not. Is. seems to be frozen. But yeah. So there you can see the slider here taking on some different colors. So that's it for that. And the other thing that was giving us a bit of trouble with um, existing CSS uh, were the fact that we were using some arrow shapes in data table and in menu. Um, for the indicators that there was an additional level of menu flyout and the arrows in calendar. So I just did some work on creating some arrows that are made uh, with CSS instead of images, image sprites. When I was, I tried to do the same thing. I, I, I guess my CSS foo is not what yours is. But I had some trouble getting cross-browser compatibility in terms of the display of, in particular, the double arrow and to some pixel precision on the placement of the individual arrows as well. But especially the double arrow started to look wonky in various browsers. But it could just be that your CSS is stronger than mine. So I'll be checking those out. I'm having some problems getting to some VMs to check it on all the different browsers. But Matt checked it for me on IE and said it was at least working. So. So the general feel here is that you can click on this double arrow, turns to a single, and the, you know they're pretty well centered. Um, but of course, this is Firefox. So anyway, I'm going down that path because then we'll be able to apply dynamic colors to this and won't be worried about the bitmaps and whether they look right on whatever background they're sitting on. So that's it. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? All right. Um, so, so moving on, performance benchmarking status is next on the agenda. I just wanted to go around and discuss where we thought we were with this particular item. As a team, as a project, we wanted to be able to establish performance baselines for critical paths in the system and also um, some important leaf nodes, like charts, for instance. Uh, so I don't know if all the right personnel are here to really 
discuss this in great detail, but I wanted to do a pulse check and see where we felt like we were. Um, the Where we left it was that we were going to be checking in performance tests into our test directory. Um, not every component was going to have tests, but uh, the most important ones we were going to prioritize and attack those first, and then somehow get those integrated into CI. Um, is there a hope of having performance benchmarking integrated with CI soon, or what are the blockers to getting there? Well, um, so that would probably be for the next year for, for things that, that Yeti could have baked into it. Um, what Yeti will have already is just timing for each test, but that is, I don't, I'm not satisfied with that as for the requirements that, that I've just even overheard. And that is a, this test took this long to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that our tests also will have, um, well, I don't know, maybe we could have assertions in the tests that cause a pass or failure based on certain criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and just treat them like automated tests that can pass or fail a build. Mm -hmm. yeah. What criteria would cause a failure if you're really just storing metrics? Yeah, I mean, so as far as the baseline goes, what we want to do is be able to um, track historical progress. So if there's a regression, we'd want to capture that. Um, Regression in performance, you mean? Yeah. So right now, right, um, our the builds that we that we run ourselves are um, capture this timing information, and we can compare it over over many different builds. So um, that's we have the infrastructure to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Yeti will will when we switch over by the end of the year, Yeti will provide that for the builds that we run internally. Um, you know, as far as having that. Um, Pushing that out, like that's something that we do also. So, like whenever we push the the reports to whywhatigithub.com, I believe we're also including the duration, and if not, that's easy to add. Um, and so, when we switch to Yeti, we'll also have that. So, per bill, maybe what we can do is is um, is show charts over time, or what you know how the total time it took to uh, to execute all of our tests, and then. Also, over time for each uh, test case, right? Yeah, and I think yeah. that's a worthy goal to get to. Yeah. I, I think from a what data is important perspective, from release to release, we want to capture that. What, what yeah. are, so and then while we're working on a release, from build to build. Yeah, so Yeti will provide that. And then really, I think the bulk of the work is what we provide as exported to the YUI you know, the HTML reports yeah. that they've set up. So. And is that on GitHub now? Yes. Well, not the, not the the graphs don't exist, but the, the table of build status. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the page is there, mm -hmm. ready to receive the data. What what could be interesting is, I mean, if you can expose this historical performance result data via some kind of API or or just you know parsable JSON or something, you could you could build tooling and maybe even CI infrastructure so that when you do a performance run, um, either a developer on their machine or on the CI system. It can then hit the API and see, like, you know, this run completed in X number of seconds. Historically, the average has been X number of seconds. If there's a huge deviation, then maybe something's wrong. I like and that. You yes. could use that to influence test failure. I, yeah, I, Tilo, is, was, wasn't Tilo working on things in this area? Yeah, so the, the current idea, the current thing that we're working towards is to take the previous stable release um, and run the benchmarks against that and whatever's on head and right. compare those. But don't we also need to, we need to come together as a group and formalize what the benchmark tests are exactly? Like, so that we're all using the same benchmark suite? Yeah, so I, I know that Tilo was actually using something that he, he took some code that I had been working with in a branch. Um, for some performance tests, and then he built something that was kind of based on that to sort right, of. Right. And, I, and I took that for myself and customized it for me. So I'm thinking we at some point we yeah. can get something that's. Yeah, if, if, if we can standardize on that kind of thing and then have everybody write their performance tests for the same way that they structure unit tests. Yeah. Um, so 
Thursday, maybe we'll do a round of demos on what's currently in the system and see if there's a simple path of convergence or highlight some differences and discuss those if we need to. Yeah, I mean, I just did minor alterations that will allow the past like more variables so I could run multiple benchmark tests for charts, like multiple pages of tests and stuff like that. Um, but is that something that should be fed back into? Yes, I yeah. think so. I mean, it's just more options. It doesn't. But uh, don't we also need to, uh, and maybe this is like doesn't necessarily hold us up too much, but don't we also have to get approval to actually pull the benchmark? That's and done. That's done? Oh. So we have, yeah, we have approval to use benchmark JS as our tool of choice, and we're Sweet. thinking about just checking that into the library as a, or into our source repo as a library. So that, you know, anyone that wants to clone YY3 and then run tests can just do it in one checkout. Nice. So that's not a problem. Okay. Okay, so I think this is something we're going to have to revisit and try to get more heads in the room to, to, to show the current state of what people have actually built and then take it from there. And then that will give us a good opportunity to figure out um, the common documentation that we need to write to allow any contributor to be helping us write more performance benchmark tests. Right. And one, one thing I, I, I spoke to Tilo about in this, uh, and maybe even an intermediary step before like full automation would be at least be able to, like, uh, I mean, I guess anybody could write this, be able to write out the results into a file uh, or, or something like that so that you wouldn't have to, like, actually comp copy them to compare or something like that. Oh yeah, was that was that Tilo or was that Yuri? I, someone else talking to. Yeah. I, I had supposed to Tilo about that, it offline. The uh, best place to store more. that locally. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that was Tilo. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of people out today, so we'll revisit next week. Okay, next step or before we move on, any final thoughts on state of performance benchmark? All right. So more on that to come. Next up, we have uh, the contributor model. Let me post the URL to that in the chat. So uh, we have a first pass up there on the wiki. And so I would like to pretty soon here come to a close on this and stamp it as the first version. Um, I'm not really sure of the right process to even get that. So I think. What I'd like to do is to go over it and just have some final discussion and then put it out for objections. And if we hear no objections, then we're just going to ratify it and move on. Um, unless there are objections to the process. Let me know if you think that there's a better way to do that. Um, maybe I'll share my screen here. So do you guys think it would be valuable to walk through this right now? Or do you guys want to take some time asynchronously I, and like comment to, offline or comment asynchronously? I think a walk through at a high level is good, but details should be asynchronous. Okay. So we'll do a quick walk through. OK. So users is the lowest common denominator. Anyone can use the project, and that makes you a user. A contributor is basically someone who has submitted a signed CLA. Um, and by extension, contributors also have a yylibrary.com account, which allows you to file bugs and um, post on the forum. There's also this idea of a mailing list. and that's something that we've been kind of going back and forth about. The mailing list is going to be the central place to have discussions. So at this point, we're pretty sure it's going to be uh, a Google group. And um, at least committers and reviewers are going to be on that mailing list. Um, it's going to be, for instance, it's going to be where I would email the mailing list and say, here's the latest version of this contribute uh, contributor model, are there any objections? If there are no objections, we're going to ratify it. And then that's the place where you would say plus one or minus one or what have you in there. And so the big question is, is it valuable to have 
contributors on that mailing list. Um, if you read down to the voting model, you must just stop. There's this notion of voting, which is plus one or minus one. And contributors actually don't have a binding vote. They just have a voice. And so is, is that going to be too much noise then to filter out who is a contributor versus who has a binding vote? And that's the real concern there is that if someone on the mailing list says plus one, we now need to figure out a way to figure out if that vote is binding or not. So to make things simpler, you know, I'm proposing that we just start at least um, have the mailing list be committers and reviewers only, and maybe contributors can read the, the mailing list but not post to it um, until we have a, some tooling in place to make it really obvious who's a contributor versus a committer. So that's one thought. I, I think um, I really like the idea of a mailing list, but I think I would lean more towards an open mailing list, um, at, at least inviting contributors in. And I, I think I wouldn't expect it to get too noisy because I, I doubt we're going to see a huge number of people become committers, at least not for a while. Um, and it should be fairly easy to, to say, you know, if it's, if it's me or Luke or Dave or Eric or somebody like that, then it's a binding vote. Um, so you're saying until we have so many committers that it's really hard to keep track of history of that? Yeah, I, I think if, if at some point suddenly YUI has, you know, 20 or 30 committers, then, then maybe you start thinking about having a committers only, committers and reviewers only mailing list. But I think initially a lot of the value of this mailing list is going to be um, discussing pull requests and discussing um, architecture changes and things like that that it would be really good to have contributor input on. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I think that uh, uh, having it be an open list and contributors have the opportunity to, or just have it be open to whoever wants to subscribe to it. And if they want to subscribe to it, they can participate in it. And by means of their participation, it also informs the team, uh, who are the active contributors, how are they contributing to the conversation, and should they be promoted to a committer. So it gives some more justification for not just the code that they're producing, but also the rationale for the decisions that they make and those sorts of things. So you're actually yes. saying that the mailing list should be completely open so that users or contributors can join? At least contributors. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, if, if, if we start, I think if it's completely open and if we start finding that people are like posting, you know, tech support questions and things, then, you know, then we can consider maybe making it invite only or something. But so Ryan, you're saying users and... Yeah, I don't, I don't really see a strong reason to, to lock it down. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would wait until there's actually a reason to lock it down. Before yeah, trust it. people to be civil, yeah. Isn't, isn't it going to be more difficult to lock it down after the fact, though? Or Not really. I mean, so one example of this would be um, initially the, the Node.js project only had a single mailing list, and that was where all development discussion happened and sort of all, you know, contributor discussion and, and even user discussions. And then as the user community got bigger and bigger and it got noisier and noisier and people were talking more about just simple technical questions instead of development issues, um, they broke it off into another mailing list and they said, you know, this new list is for, you know, actual development discussions about core and you can keep using whatever the old one was for, you know, your your tech support questions. And and that actually worked reasonably well. But you would have not never no point actually lock down the existing list. You just create a new one that's more restricted. You you could create a new one or I mean I think locking down the existing one would be fine too and, and just saying, you know, we've created a different list for you guys to discuss this the stuff that you've been you know, that's, that's making this list noisy, but whichever way. So the distinction between the mailing list and the forum, per se, would be that mm -hmm. the mailing list isn't about getting support. It's about active development and decisions about active development. Yeah, I, I think it should be more about, you know, people who are working on, on the core or interested in contributing to the core in some way, whether it's documentation or code or... Or, or just give, giving input on pull requests. Sorry, we, 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 lost we, you for... we cut out for a second there. Was there a net net summary of the last a minute? 90 seconds? Uh, yeah, I mean, just net net. It seems to me like the, the purpose of this list would be any discussion relating to 
the YUI core in terms of the the design and development and architecture of the product. Guide them, you know, to to take that somewhere else, to take that to the forums, or to take that to IRC. And if it becomes a big problem, then you know, then deal with it then. Okay, very good. So start open. I see folks too just put it not like binding or not binding in other mailing lists too. We're just all done the same one. So it's until it gets to be unreasonable. Yeah, that's a good policy. Okay. Um, so we'll actually make the mailing list completely open and then um, take it from there. I think that's fine. So then we have the committers group. Committers are, um, let's see, uh, voted in by reviewers and uh, typically sh show the potential to be aligned with the um, project. So. One example of this is um, if someone uh, issues only pull requests that kind of serve their company or their project's needs without um, think, taking into account the, the benefit of code change for the platform as a whole or um, you know, making design decisions that um, are, again, just kind of one track minded rather than for the benefit of the whole community, that would, you know, that's something that might limit your contribution committership. So we want people who really understand the API we're providing for the entire community and provide code changes that benefit the entire community as a platform API. Um, so there's a, a nomination and a voting process and reviewers uh, bring committers on board. Um, let's see. The, I don't know if this is called out here, but the fact that you're a committer basically means that you have right access to our repo on GitHub. So that's probably something I should sell out here. Don't you think? Yeah, definitely. I don't remember from my earlier reading. Is there something spelled out for uh, 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 problem resolution? So if somebody commits something, in a manner that isn't proper. Yeah, so if there's ever any problem, then the process down here in the voting section um, allows for reviewers to nominate the removal of the data privilege. OK, so I'll add the right repo. And then um, there's more There's more <coughs> later about um, actual how to make code changes to the repo. Um, yeah, so here it says, um, once earned, it can be removed by reviewers. And then, beyond the committer status, we have reviewer status, project admin status um, for the repo on GitHub, and then um, responsibilities to bring on new committers and, when necessary, remove committership privilege. And then reviewers are really kind of the the gatekeepers of the project in the sense that all code that comes through, reviewers are expected to review that code and um, make sure that bad code doesn't enter. And it, it's really the, the job of everyone in the community to kind of have that oversight. But um, when push comes to shove, it kind of, you know, the buck stops at the reviewer level. Um, the other important caveat is that reviewers are not subject to this type of gatekeeping in the sense that they are kind of trusted to be able to um, make code changes that are not adverse to the code base. So, Chimondo, Pablo, I'm not sure if that's his name, Juan, um, has a comment about he, he likes the way this is set so. up. Oh, uh, he's, he's so. plus one. Yeah, he's, he's agreeing about keeping the mailing list open. Okay, good. He's um, and then, when there's a problem with achieving consensus, then the reviewers group will um, resolve any conflicts and make the final decision. And the idea here is to not get bottlenecked by a lack of decision making. So um, ultimately, it's up to the reviewers to make sure that all decisions can be made and, and the project can move on. 
Um, there's a private mailing list for reviewers that, um, that you can talk about voting and legal matters. And other than that, everything that's technical in nature needs to be on that open mailing list. Um, there's some detail around how you can qualify to be a committer or a reviewer, so I do encourage everyone to, to take a moment and read it to yourself and figure out if you have any feedback in those areas. We do acknowledge that it's kind of arbitrary, so we just kind of put a, a line in the sand saying, okay, we'll just call it 50 and see how it goes. Um, if it's not working out, we can certainly modify that, that baseline. Uh, this is just a caveat to say that um, support is voluntary and um, not guaranteed, and that there are multiple channels of getting support, mainly through the forum or IRC. So then, um, when we get to talking about code, um, there are contribution standards, which we'll review after this document, um, that all contributions want to meet. And we want to codify it and be pretty specific about the, the bar of excellence that we want code to have as it comes in, code and documentation and tests and everything, um, so that it's not a guessing game and that everyone, whether you work for Yahoo or you're on the YUI core team at Yahoo or not, whether you're a user, or sorry, a contributor or, or a reviewer, everyone's kind of um, playing by the same rules because it has nothing to do with anything other than the quality of the code. So now we get into some detail about voting and what gets voted on and all that good stuff. Um, I'll review at a high level, so please take some time to dive a little deeper and provide feedback. Um, let's see. In general, technical decisions we want to um, ratify through lazy consensus, and that basically means that there's a healthy discussion um, and then it goes to the vote. If, if no one objects, then the thing is approved. And that's true on the mailing list, and that's also true in GitHub pull requests. So a pull request is just another way of proposing a change. It's actually the preferred way of proposing a change to the library. So, and maybe I should, yeah, here we go. They can issue a pull request on GitHub or post to the mailing list. And so let's take a pull request. Um, if you want to change some code in the library, you change it in your form, you issue a pull request, and as long as no one objects, within 72 hours, that thing can get merged in. And so that's true for committers and reviewers because they have right access. Um, if you are a contributor, then you'll need someone who has right access to actually do the merge for you. Um, and so, you know, there is a 72-hour window to allow people, you know, all over the world, whether you're, you know, in a different time zone or whatever, to have enough time to do that review. And I do mention that, you know, reviewers are the ultimate gatekeepers in this process of of minus oneing or having objection if, uh, if they don't if they don't think some code should be merged in. But it really is up to the entire community to be looking at pull requests and providing feedback. So. Um, we hope that that's really how it ends up working out. Is there a way on GitHub to indicate whether or not we're in a code freeze uh, when these pull requests are coming in? That's a good question. Does anyone know if we can have API or has some flag or toggle? <clears throat> I don't think it does that kind of project level. Why not just have a top level MD file that's something like library state that gets updated depending yes. on? You would have to uh, you'd have to check in a, a code change to that MD file during a code freeze to indicate that you're in a code freeze. Well, right before code freeze, and then you check in when you're when you're defrosting. So I think um, a really low tech way of doing it is just having an email on the mailing list that says we are now entering code freeze. And if you're not paying attention, then you know if you don't pay attention like a lot, then you can have your permission removed. Yeah, no, or the front page of the wiki. That's another well, that, but it's going to be in that calendar, right? It's going to be in the schedule, so you can go to calendar and see when code freeze is starting. So. We can do that for now, and then if there's, if we want to do this more technically, we can post like pull request status update or something. But we don't probably don't have to do that until we get to or having so many people that one of them is online. So. Okay. 
so yeah, I think ideally there is a programmatic way of um, you know preventing code changes during code freeze. Uh, There's also but, nothing wrong with submitting a pull request during. Correct. Code As a committer, it is your job to know when we're in a code freeze and not merge in changes. So, yeah. One thing that I was just thinking about that would be really neat is um, like we have the Eric provided the Chrome plugin for the uh, those who have signed the CLA that has the drop down. If there was something like that for the library status, uh, like if we, if we know of known issues for CDN problems or something like that, that uh, I think about working on um, in this next coming quarter was like an app that would allow you to see like the status of the builds. Know if the tree is open and closed. You know this could also be a Chrome extension as well, where you could just basically see current status of things. So that might be something that would be added. That tree is open, tree is closed, things like that. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. Oh, okay. One thing also to clarify with um, with community committers is the the distinction between the different levels of code freeze, like feature freeze versus. Um... Oh, did I just lose you guys? Yeah. All right. This time again with feeling. All right. You guys actually in the hangout now? Yes. Uh, now we are. We're back. Okay. So I was I was starting to say that uh, it would be useful to to clarify for the community the distinction between things like feature freeze or soft code freeze versus hard code freeze. Yeah. You know when you can make doc commits versus when you can make code changes. I'll find the right place to talk about that. Uh, Shawan was saying the uh, possibility of having a bot where uh, when you're in code freeze, the bot can come in on a pull request or something. That's just that would be a really good idea, I think. The, d the difficult part with that would be distinguishing. Well, I guess, you know, it's. sort of documentation, but. How intelligent the bot, the bot can be about what type of commit it is versus what type of freeze it is. But yeah, uh, that, I like that idea a lot. Um, okay. And the other thing about lazy consensus is that it, the whole point is to not have bottlenecks. So kind of get these changes in code moving through the system. Um, but also, the flip side of that is to have healthy discussions. So if there's objection, then it's kind of up to the pull request issuer to um, respond to those objections, and either with code or discussion or what have you. So, um, yeah, that's what I said. So now, uh, not all technical decisions can be made using lazy consensus. So there are larger issues. Um, it's not really easy to codify exactly what needs to be voted on formally versus lazy consensus, uh, but. Larger things like you know refactoring or introduction of new modules, um, bigger decisions. I think uh, will flip it into this territory. Um, and the more we do it, the more we'll understand where that line is. I think too. So when we vote, it's going to be on the mailing list, um, or it could also be in a pull request. But usually, these are going to be much bigger changes. So probably not pull request. And then there's this idea of the binding versus non-binding. Um, and a non-binding is anyone that's a user or a contributor. A binding vote is committers and reviewers. Um, and then, so that's, this is this section um, talks about the process by which to vote. And then this section talks about, oh, these are the different types of votes. So. There are votes where, as long as you have more plus ones than minus ones, it's OK. Or this requires three plus ones with no objections in order to be ratified, et cetera. And then this is the part that um, is kind of the first pass or line in the sand, and I'm sure will evolve over time. So when do we need a vote? Documentation or adding tasks. So these are non-code changes um, to the repo. And that's no uh, vote is ever required. If you want to you know, update the docs or fix a typo or add a test, by all means, everyone is welcome to do so. Then when you have a code change, we do want to follow the lazy consensus rule, where as long as there are no objections within 72 hours, this can be merged in. Oh, and the other thing that's up there that I didn't cover, um, um, if a reviewer 
wants to merge code in, it does. It did say that reviewers don't need to be reviewed, so they're trusted to to be always merging code in without the 72-hour waiting period. And so, by extension, if there's a pull request and a reviewer says, "Hey, this looks good to go. No need to wait the 72 hours," then that code can also be merged in right away. If not, we do want to leave that 72-hour window open so that anyone in the community has a chance to make an objection. This is not a plus one means it goes in. It means we want to make sure that there are no minus ones before we merge it in. I have one question regarding reviewers' roles. Um, who is the enforcer of the, this document? Say so someone checks in something, 48 hours, slip things in. Who, is, who are the people who's enforcing the, the rules? Like whose responsibility is it to go and say, um, we need to let you know you did this new standard? Like that. Is that something we get to code from the document or how does that work? So I believe it's the role of everyone in the community to to That's make sure that everyone else is you know abiding by what we have defined here. So yeah. if if um, something gets merged in too early, then anyone can object and say, hey, this got merged in too early. But then it is up to reviewers to vote on taking action if a committer needs to have their committership revoked. Okay. And that's really the only action that can be taken other than discussion and communication, which anyone in the community So does that need to be spelled out saying we were considering everyone to be self-regulated? Yeah, I, that's a good point. Is there any measure of, uh, so, so I guess what, what I'm asking, and it, it's some kind of a sinister scenario that's that's coming up in my mind. So like, if, if there is a rogue reviewer who is not following best practices, is there a path to removing her? Yes, absolutely. So that's here. Okay. That's at the bottom of this table. So um, so there was the code change, lazy consensus. A bigger architectural change, um, we're seeing two-third majority of reviewers can ratify that change. And so that's through a formal vote in the mailing list, or I guess a pull request is also possible, although unlikely. And then, so that's really only two types of code changes we've identified, normal changes and then big changes. And then we've got new committers, uh, consensus approval by reviewers. New reviewers can also be brought in with consensus approval of existing reviewers. And then we have committer and reviewer removal. And that's by um, unanimous consensus of reviewers. So this is kind of the meat of the matter, I think, of how things are going to play out. So if there's any points of discussion here, I'd like to take a moment to see if anyone has anything they want to add. I really like this. I think this is a, a fantastic um, contributor model. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, really like it so far. Yeah, so let's take some time offline and really dig into the, the language here and, and feel free to make um, edits or actually I don't know it's a wiki so anyone can edit but I don't know if that's like I don't know if there's a process to comment without changing because I, I wouldn't want at this point because we're reviewing it I wouldn't want us to make any big changes without discussing do you want to <laughs> do you want to copy it over into a gist or something and then have a discussion in the gist if there is a discussion to be had I'll do Google Doc because it, it can preserve these tables and um, just okay. So I got a comment from IRC saying Tesla Nick saying uh, not saying it's a bad idea, just that historically I've seen a lot of communication problems caused by process or technology. So he's, saying he's just voicing his concern to adding all this process may slow things down. A bit. I think this document is about removing process. Ultimately, I mean, it's it's creating a structure, but uh, it, you know, it's 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 opening up the the internal processes of YUI and removing barriers, essentially. Yeah. So. Are you being specific about the, the bots? Uh, oh, the bots. the bots. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, I noticed this concern in IRC as well about the bots. I I, I would be less concerned about the bots because the bots <coughs> the bots that we were talking about specifically were to <laughs> notify pull. Uh, people that issue a pull request, that their pull request uh, is falling inside of a code freeze. And because it's falling inside of a code freeze, that means that it it isn't applicable for the 72-hour lazy commit. 
Uh, but otherwise, it, the bot should be doing nothing. I mean, it, it's mainly just to inform you that you've fallen in this window, and then. So if the the notion of a bot to do a lot of a lot other a lot of other things a lot more, we start adding more and more bots, then I can see uh, I can see that concern. But I think as a starting point, uh, it, it's this using a bot for that function is a really good way to expose that information that might not be as accessible otherwise. It puts it right there in your face if you issue yeah, a pull request. Right. Yeah. Can you guys hear the um, air conditioner? Yes. Oh, sorry. All right. As long so, as you don't see like bloody body parts falling out of the ceiling or something. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. Now that we've just kind of gone through and reviewed at a high level, I will leave it up to you guys to um, dig through at a deeper level and add comments to the Google Doc that I will send out. Um, let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Okay. Uh, so contribution standards. Okay, we'll come back and do the developer workflow later. I don't think there's a lot of controversy around that. So um, I think there's a lot of detail that we could end up adding into this to flesh this out, but I just wanted to um, start with the first pass at what the baseline is for code to land into our master branch. And that is complete API docs with great code comments. Unit tests, and this is a number that, um, as far as the team goes, we want to get higher, up to 90, um, and maybe even more over time. But uh, for the community, we want, you know, we want everyone to be on the same page as where we are today. And then, when you're writing a new component, you need to provide a well-written user guide and. By well-written, I mean in content. So we have um, editing services at your disposal. So as long as the content is all there, we can certainly clean up any grammar or um, um, you know, flow of, of, of uh, ideas and, and things like that. And then we have uh, automated our functional examples to serve, uh, or we have automated our, the testing of our examples to serve as our functional test suite. And so uh, when you add new features to our code base, we would like you to add the appropriate functional tests as well. And that also serves to uh, the example documentation, which is actually really popular for our users. Um, so that's a win all around. And then um, is that just on the, on the functional testing, is that something that's um, documented externally? Because I, I know that happened after I, I left the team, so I don't know how that's all built. I thought it was. I thought it's on the wiki, actually. OK. And now that we're using this wiki so much more, we're going to come in and clean up some of this stuff. Yeah, we would like to re outline it, make it so that it's uh, even like, a, like yeah. a master page that links off to everything. So I'll add that to this doc. Oops. Um, and then one other uh, separate comment on the on the user guides and examples. Um, uh, I think. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Before pulling something into the library, I think it should have user guides and examples. Um, but I think for the review process, it can be useful to for somebody to, to maybe create a pull request for a component to get the code reviewed and maybe get a tentative, like, once you write a user guide and examples, we would like to pull this into the library before spending all that time on the user guide and examples. Oh, I'm yeah, that's die. a good point. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a whole process. Like, if you're going to be contributing a new component, then there's a whole process, I think, that you should follow that, I guess, could be better better outlined here, where you start with an API review, and then you move on to a design review, and then you do a code review, and then... Well, forget about the gallery. 
Yeah, so so starting with an API review makes sense. If if I sit down and I say, I would like to develop a new component for YUI Core from scratch, I have this idea, then I think that's the case where I would send an email to the committer list and, and we would start by talking about an API and, and then, you know, like, build it from there. Yeah. Um, but say a case where somebody has already developed a component, like, like, you know, something that I've done for SmugMug that we're already using, and then I want to offer that for inclusion in YUI if I think it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so like one case where this happened was uh, uh, template.micro, right? So I had already written that. So then I, you know, I, I wanted to go through the review process to get the feedback from the team. Um, and so that was very valuable from the code perspective before I had written any documentation. And then the assumption was if the team likes this and decides that it should get pulled in, then I would write documentation. Although as it happened, Eric ended up generously offering to write the documentation for me, which was super That's awesome. you. Yeah, so I totally in that case, that. I think that you were using the pull request as a discussion forum. Sort and of. It, we would have been remiss to merge in that pull request without the documentation there. Yeah. So yeah, so, so I, I think, I don't know if there's a way to, to call that out in the document as, or I don't know, to, to somehow codify that this is something you can do if you want to get code feedback before you spend all this time on documentation. You Maybe you can go ahead and file a pull request, get the feedback, and then if consensus on the pull request is good, then add the docs to the pull request, and then it'll get pulled in. Yeah, I think, I think having the step-by-step uh, -step process uh, laid out from the very beginning, like whenever it's in the concept phase, would be good. And wherever, you, wherever it is that you're stepping in, um, like if you go ahead and write the component, write all the documentation and unit tests and all that, and then there's changes, yeah. then, then that's just on you. Okay. You, you didn't start from step one, or like you took it upon yourself to, to start at a certain phase. Like if, if Ryan had already had documentation up and then there were changes to be made to it, um, then he would know that he would have to go back and change the documentation. Yeah. But if you go ahead and write the component because you think it's a good idea, or it, you find it useful for a project that you're working on, and then say you're jumping, you're starting the review process or the, the, the pull request process at step three instead of yeah. conception phase. Okay. So I'll take the first step, but I really will rely on you guys who are actually in the guts of that process to fine tune it for me. Well, I think one thing is to uh, realize that a pull request isn't, it's not like it's going to happen in 72 hours from there. You may want to issue a pull request and start the process rolling. So this it's not like an assumption of where pull request is like the end of the process. It could be that it's where you're saying, I need feedback from the community. And I want exactly. to yeah. yeah, that's a really so good we, way of putting it. Right, there's really nothing wrong with closing a pull request that, and not putting it in. Well, right, we yeah. need to really specify that pull requests are a, a valid forum for discussion. and. Um, not all pull requests are expected to get merged in. I mean, personally, I plan on putting in pull requests at some points with the explicit notion that it's not going to go in. Exactly, that's my point, yeah. Sometimes you want to issue a pull request to get feedback on stuff that you know is not going to get merged in. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think um, the way that the proposal process is set up right now, uh, where there's an open communication, uh, if that's something that can go in as a pull request, even if it's like a markdown file um, somewhere, I'm not really sure where it would, how that, where that would live to have it as a pull request against the against the the whole project. Um, well, I, I know for um, for things for like architectural changes or or feature proposals and things like that, we've used gists before because you can comment on them and people can modify them and propose changes and things like right. that. And that only gets complicated if you start to have like. Uh, version to version nitty gritty line changes where it's nice to see a diff, but otherwise, I, yeah, I, I agree that the gist has worked pretty well for those discussions, right. design discussions. But can you issue a pull request to the library in, from a gist? No, at that point you'd have to form. No, no, this not. So in that case, let's just use the mailing list. Well, I, I think a, a gist has value for for some of the things that. That end up going on the on the wiki, for example, about proposals to the library. Wait, say that one more time. So, so um, things like I mean, I see, I see on the wiki even now. There's um, 
Uh, let's see. There's a proposal for a widget pop-up. There's a proposal that I did a while back for attribute value filters. Um, things like that can start out as gists if you want early feedback from people in comments. Um, yeah, oh, my only point is that, so there's two funnels for community feedback. One is a pull request, because you can always go to the polls list and just review whatever's outstanding, or the mailing list. So if you're going to create a gist that is a proposal, you need to let everyone know. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you would say on the mailing list, I've created this proposal. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, like, rather than having all discussion about it on the mailing list, it can be actually... In the gist, the, yeah. So you just link to the gist in the mailing list. Right. So it's, yeah. so it's best to vote for But my point being, if you create a gist, then no, not everyone who needs to see it is going to see it. Right. You Unless like you email so, so you should announce it on the mailing list. Okay. I should... Um, and then I do want to stress proper commit logs. We are going to get, so, um, you know, there's some, some tactical things, but we want to reference bugs properly when we're fixing bugs, and we want to um, attribute contributions when it's a pull request. So we're going to have to document the, the proper ways of, of getting that into the um, commit log because ultimately, we want to programmatically create release notes, um, and so that will help us get there. I don't think that's going to happen. I, uh, programmatically creating release notes from commit logs, um, you tend to end up with noisy release notes and release notes that are very relevant to people interested in the development of something, but not so much targeted towards users of that thing. Well, it's not, the release notes will not solely be um, commit log content. It will just be part of it. So um, yeah. the release notes, we have all resigned ourselves to the fact that they need to be manually edited and curated. OK. But for instance, um, if every pull request can be properly uh, commit logged, then for every release, we know, we'll know all the contributors for that release, and we'll be able to have that included in the release notes. Well, I think one one sign of a really good pull request would be something that includes an update to the release notes for a change. Wait, say that again? I, I think a really high quality pull request would include a, an update to the release notes for whatever the change is. Oh. So, I mean, I don't think that should be solely the, a thing that oh reviewers do or that the core team does. I think everybody should be responsible for that. That's such a good addition, and that's something we've been discussing here. Is yeah. History files are not being updated um, regularly around here, so. It's almost like, just like you have to have tests, you have to update history. Yeah. It's, it's an easy thing to forget, too, but I think if people um, remember to look for that when they review pull requests and, and mention it, then uh, people I start doing it. Ask if we can come up with like a checklist that's referenceable. So before you do your pull request, well, yeah, but this, I mean, something that, that's like just a quick thing that you can just plain set and say, OK, I've got these five things. It didn't go. As opposed to having to read the entire document. But that, it, it'll come from this. This right, is the right. source of truth for that. Document. Yeah, we just need to make it into a Sublime plugin. But not everyone uses Sublime. So. Well, they should. Oh. What did you do? <laughs> um, okay, we're broadcasting here. So, you know, Dave has put a lot of effort into making the contribution process a lot easier. And, I mean, this is, so these are all tools that help you know, everyone sitting at this table's life easier and also um, everyone in the Hangout, too. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, I would love a little more beefing up of the documentation around how to really use these tools like, um, you know, the daily YUI developer workflow is a great tutorial, for instance, that's missing. Yes. So that's all, I think, content that needs to be I think like do, like, case studies where, you know, you're contributing a small snippet of code. Here's the whole, here's the whole life cycle of that commit, and the whole, the whole work And there's a really good architecture on here's a life cycle for that big. Yeah, that's great. You be able to spell that out. Yeah. And, and also some of these little things that, that we tend to take for granted, like um, separating commits for source versus built files and 
things like that that oftentimes new contributors don't realize they should do. Yeah, so that, I think that's here. Oh, is it? Okay. Let's look at that next. What, what, did, what did Ryan just say? I just completely separate the source and build. Oh. Any submission that uses open source from another project must be called out. That's the ease. And then even if something's been merged in, we can at any point unmerge it for the commit. Does it need to be anything that talks about when we elevate or de-elevate something from the gallery? Like if something is wholly being moved out of court of the gallery or back in, is that just something that reviewers decide? Like what's what's the what we get minus core versus gallery? Wait, what's the question? Well the question is like so someone's checking in, um, someone's worked on something on the gallery for a long time and they're ready to add it to core. Or the, okay. Um, is that something that's an addition, a separate check-in, or does it stay in the gallery and just is now included in a build? Like, what happens? What's that process where it's You mean now? a technical process for moving something from gallery to, to core? Right. Is it stay in the same repo? Is it now become that part of this, the core repo? I mean, you, you move the code to the source directory of the YY3 repo. Okay. And the same thing for when we move it out, we're just going to add it and create a gallery component. Yeah, if you want to move something out, then you have to create a, a separate standalone repo to house and you have something that's moving out. Right. So is that uh, something that needs to be spelled out in here at all? No. Okay. Um, okay, so any other comments on contribution standards? Is this enough of a baseline or is there anything missing for the first pass? Uh, you, you'll definitely want to document what a proper commit log or a link off to it, but a link off to a, what a proper commit log looks like, for example. Yeah, nothing from ours. All right. And then we have a couple different pages on the website that will be superseded by this once it's finalized. Um, but this is all about the fact that uh, github.com has our source of truth repo, how to point to it, and how to manage um, the different branches that we use. So we are adopting a pre-commit model where the dev-x branches are where code check-ins go into. And then once new code passes through CI, um, after a successful build, then the code change can then be merged into the master or read.x branch. So the dev star branch is the integration branch, and then um, the code doesn't land in the other branches, the release branches, until it's been vetted through CI. So that's the overall idea for that. Um, so one part of this that, that I think is a little confusing, and I've seen a few people already be tripped up on this in yeah. pull requests, is that GitHub automatically tries to issue a pull request against master. Yeah. And so people need to know that they need to manually change that to one of the other branches. Uh, and is that configurable? No. Unless we submit a feature request to GitHub. Yeah. Well, I mean, cool. yeah, on, on GitHub you can change the default branch of a project, but then that, that wouldn't really fix this problem. Um, right. Why not? Well, because then that's where people will be like, when they come to our GitHub landing page, which is not working. Yeah. We don't want to. No, we want to get a master, master not dev master. master. Yeah. So maybe pulling out the, the zip file or looking at the source code. So, right. so the idea. Can someone convince me of that? That we want people to. Well, well, the idea behind this branching strategy is that you want the default branch, which is master, to always be relatively stable. You want it to always represent something that. Releasable. It's tested and releasable, and yeah. Um, if you were to change the default branch so that pull requests went to dev master, um, then that would always that would also mean that the first thing people see when they go to github.com slash yy slash yy3 is dev master instead of master. So then they end up potentially depending on, you know, development code instead of the stable stuff, which is the opposite of what you want. But people who are coming to GitHub are not interested in the release packages because there are other places for that. They're interested in the source code. Well, then I think the question would be, why not make master the development branch and have you know a stable master or a something else 
because simply of legacy. Hmm. Because master has always been where the releases are cut off of. Hmm. And this way it may remain so. Okay. So the, the catch then is that, um, yeah, people are going to have to know that master is not where new commit should go. It has to go to dev master first. Wait, so I still don't feel convinced that we shouldn't change the default branch in GitHub. Well, changing the default branch wouldn't actually solve the problem. It would just, I mean, it, changing the default branch to dev master would be just like saying, you know, instead of rolling releases off master, let's roll releases off a different branch. You're just you're making that change via a different process. Also, that won't solve a problem for when the commit is intended, when the pull request is intended for dev three x. Well, that's a different story. But it, it would still it still requires thought on behalf of the developer of where yeah, three different ways. ways. Well, let's reserve that conversation. Um, if we change the default branch to dev master, then would pull requests go to dev master? By default. Yeah, by default. I have a question on IRC. It's uh, saying, I still don't understand the difference with the dev dash 3.x and dev dash master. Should every pull request be made against dev dash 3.x? Okay, so it's worth clarifying that. Um, and we'll, we'll include this in the document too. I, I think, I mean, to me, I think the least surprising thing would be if master were unstable. Um, ah. Master is the default branch, it's unstable. Pull requests go to master. And a, a stable release branch would be something else, and you would pull from master when when you're ready to do that. That's what yeah. That's what other projects have done. I've seen it. I've, I've seen it done both ways, but I, I think just because of the the restrictions that GitHub puts on it, and and the way that GitHub treats master, I think that might be less surprising to people. Is there anything with Travis and all the other kind of systems that need it to be master? Uh, I don't know. Wait. So what are you proposing? I'm I'm just proposing having the the least surprising thing for new committers be the thing that that we use, which would mean master would be unstable. Yeah. So pull requests would go to master. It's and reversing the roles of the dev and the master, so that you can have a stable. I believe there are technical complexities that make that expensive. So um, I'll I'll have to wait until Dave gets back to walk us through those complexities. Um, so let's hold off on that change for now. But to go back to Juan's question, let me just clarify for everyone the difference between master and 3.x. So we've adopted a hybrid ver you know, semantic versioning scheme for, um, for YY3 in, in that we have three release numbers. Um, so if you go to the last number, if you know, right now we're on stable version 373, the last number indicates a small um, bug fix release where uh, the changes are bug fixes only, no new features, um, and no API breakages. And then if the middle number changes, so, so the next release, if that's 3.8 or 37, that means that um, either a new component or a new large chunk of API functionality has been introduced and or there have been API breakages that you need to be aware of. And then the first number, if we go from version three to version four, there are major architectural changes that break proper compatibility for every component in the system. We've also left room for emergency hotfix releases. And in that case, we would introduce a fourth number so we'd go 373-1, oh sorry, actually it was 373 plus 1, um, which would indicate that we are, um, we created a branch off of whatever's on production and did a very small incremental hotfix release for a very specific purpose that's really, really targeted in scope and has absolutely minimal regression uh, risk. So given that model, um, the master branch indicates all code changes that are appropriate for uh, a bug fix release. So going from 373 to 374 
any code change that would fit under that can go into master. And that makes master always releasable. So we can at any point cut a 374 and feel fairly confident in the, in the regression risk. All um, development happening on the 3.x branch indicates the next major release, uh, which would be the 3.8 release is what we're currently working on. So that's bigger functionality changes, new APIs that are being introduced, and potential API breakages. So it's just an indicator to the community that when you go from 373 to 374, you can feel fairly confident in that upgrade. Um, and then 37 to 38, you're going to get some new features, but uh, there is slightly more of a regression risk. So you know, do the appropriate testing of your application. So, you know, the, the rule of thumb we have in, in mind is if it's something small, if it's a bug fix, then it can go into master. If it's something larger that warrants community feedback or a larger review, then check it into the 3.x branch. So any questions around that? So that's our branching strategy, master versus 3.x. And then the dev dash indicates all code that can go in in um, before CI and then after CI, that code lands in the branch without the dev dash in front of it. So yeah, I think that it could be named better. If we can clear some of the technical hurdles that we feel are blocking us, then we might go ahead and rename to be a little bit more intuitive. Um, for instance, maybe we want to have master in 3.x and then call the stable branches stable master and stable 3.x, for instance. That might be more intuitive. Or even release master, release 3.x. But the last thing I want to do right now is open a meeting discussion. So we'll just leave it at that for now. Okay. Anything else for the, I think we're talking about the dev workflow? Oh, we haven't really finished going through it. Okay. So that's our branching strategy. Um, We have pretty specific guidelines on how to set up your Git environment. And then here's the overall workflow that um, I think, you know, as Andrew mentioned, a screencast would be a good addition to this content. So we always want to see feature branches um, from our contributors, and that really allows for isolated code reviews through the pull request. So if you're not working in a branch, then your pull request is going to be really un unreasonable to work with. Um, then we have our contribution standards that we want you to follow. After you commit your changes, push them to your fork on GitHub and then issue the pull request. So here we can do a lot better in explaining the three different branches. Oh, the live docs branch I didn't really cover, but that is um, documentation only changes that we can uh, push to the website um, very easily without any friction at all. So we encourage um, any sort of documentation related changes that are okay for production today to just go into the live doc branch and we'll just push it up as soon as we can. Okay, so then after you submit your pull request, that's where we want to see the community feedback happening and have discussions and objections and all that stuff. Um, then you can incorporate whatever feedback you got, get it up to where you have no objections, and then um, when, when you when you're working on a feature branch and you have issued a pull request and you incorporate new code into that branch, the pull request can automatically update, which is a really great feature of, of GitHub. So the discussion can continue live as your code evolves and gets better. And then after there are no objections, then someone will merge in the pull request into the core library. So again, tips are to always work from the feature branch. Um, and then, again, there's this caveat about the branching. So we'll just be reiterative about what all the different branches are and make that very clear. 
Any more think, comments on this? I think another aspect of that is we need to describe how just how Yogi works in office and all these new tools and how that plays into your development all the way through to your um, request. So if, I don't know if there's any tools for issuing pull requests from Yogi. I think there is. Including that. Uh, there's what? There's uh, what? I think you can issue pull requests from Yogi. Is that true? Uh, but anyway, just including with that, so that it's not just that aspect, but just all parts of it. Yeah, so this section here has a lot more content that can be fleshed out. So, I'll need to have everything. Um, anything else? All righty. The next item on the agenda is this committer mailing list, or I should say, what should I call it? User mailing list? or what you Contributor like mailing list. I think. What's that? I would call it a contributor mailing list. Okay. Even though technically it's open to the public. Yeah. Um, it's for, it's for I, discussion of contributions, I guess. I think it's been created. We just need to promote it and have everyone join at this point. So um, maybe what we'll do is do a blog post announcing it. And then once I've done that, um, the notes from today will go into that. And we'll start using that as our you know, communication forum for technical discussions that are not on pull requests. All right. So, OK, it's 320. Um, I have a couple like technical uh, discussions that are not process or community related that I'd like to move on to. Uh, before we move on, does anyone have any final thoughts on the stuff that we've been talking about so far? All righty. So this is a ticket that's been at, um, around for a little bit, and so I would like to achieve some closure on it. And so I think this is the right forum to get everyone's thoughts and see if um, we can get some code merged in for it. Um, delegated click event attached to a container is fired even though it is disabled in IE. So. You your screen? I am. Yes. Luke, this might be a blast from the past. Luke is gone. Yeah, Luke, Luke had to drop off for another meeting. Oh, okay. Well, that was really good timing. <laughs> <laughs> you knew you were going to sit. Oh. <laughs> Next time, don't tell us what the agenda is beforehand. That's true. Okay. <laughs> um. My guess would be that this is just some IE behavior that maybe the event system needs to normalize. I see. OK, so you think this is an IE conditional that's missing? That would be my guess. I mean, I haven't I haven't dug into the event system to inspect this. I just I went through and made sure it wasn't anything in view. Okay. So in general, I have a bucket of bugs like this that I feel are relatively contained improvements to the code base that aren't really actively being worked on by anyone. So I would like to use this forum and maybe the mailing list to throw them out there to the community for discussion. Um, Using the tools that we have today, I think what I'd like to do is assign this to an unassigned owner to make it really obvious that these are bugs in that type of bucket and that anyone in the community is welcome to take a stab at fixing it. One thing you could do is, is just have a page on the wiki that has, you know, this is a looks like a small issue that somebody just needs to investigate and figure out and it's been around for a while. and. Just have a, a list of links to things that if people are looking for a, a project to learn more about developing for YUI or or, or just bored. One better than that, I would like to make that a bug report so it's just it's dynamically always showing all the unassigned tickets. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. So I don't I don't uh, I don't know if there's anything worth discussing at this meeting without you know having people actually do some background on it. Uh, but uh, I did want to introduce the idea that I do have a number of bugs that fit into that category. So 
Um, let me get that set up and get that report set up, and then we can have we can evangelize the list and say, hey, here's a list of unassigned bugs. If anyone's interested in picking something up. Sure, we'll include it as almost like a standard thing in this this meeting. Yeah. Anyone mm -hmm. talk about some new bug or? Yeah, and I do think this is a, a good forum if you are in the community and you're looking at this and you're like, oh, let me take a look, and then you take a look and you're like, hmm, I have a couple of ideas, but I'm not sure. Right. Bring it up in the mailing list or in a pull request or in this forum and get some discussion going and see what people think about your different ideas. Maybe they're stuck on something that you can help from us live to be able to talk to them. Yeah. Is there such a thing as an unsigned user yet? Not yet. I have to create one. No. <laughs> I don't think the mailing was working for the unsigned user and I couldn't get it in public, so I need to. Oh. I created the unsigned user mailing list you wanted to send this to, but I can't get it in the outside world. Okay, we'll talk to it. All right. Um, Lid status. So, at some point in the near future, I would like static analysis failures to fail the build. Um, it's going to take a concerted amount of effort to clean up the current code base to get to that point, but that will be well worth it. Um, I, we I think that's, you're going to invite a world of pain there. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a worthy goal to try and have, you know, as few lint failures as possible. But there are, there are always going to be edge cases where you need to do something in the library that's going to cause a lint failure. Like, like I know in YUI Core, actually, just the other day, I noticed there's a, there's a place now where we're doing a, a function constructor call, which results in eval code, and that would be a lint failure. Are there not ways of ignoring in line certain lines? Yeah, you can uh, you can add comments in there for most of the things, but if, I not I if you use JS lint. If you use JS hint, most things you can say ignore this. Um, yeah, it's using JS hint. Well, no. We use JS hint, right? Then yeah. I propose that we. At least Yogi does. Are moving to JS hint? Well, I think we already. Have. Yeah. But there, there are still, even in JS hint, there are still some things that you can't disable warnings for. Right. Um, I don't remember what they all are off the top of my head, but there are a few things. Can you, uh, let me ask if you know, can, can, does anybody know if you can uh, disable strict equality? Yeah, you can. Okay, cool. Why would you want to? Because in my use case, I'm right and Lint is wrong. And <laughs> And it happens a lot, and I don't. So, so I the catch is, um, all the you can only disable this stuff on a file by file basis. You can't disable it line by line. Right. So if you if you turn it off because you've got one place in a file where you need to do. Well, I, I, I need to turn it things. off because I have a lot of places. Basically, I'm doing string comparisons that are known string comparisons, and double equal is actually better than triple equal in this case, because there is the obscure case where a string object would cause a fail, and. Uh, that I don't want that. I mean, te technically, the, the count that it, it's such an edge case. But if you're going to be, you know, granular about it, you may as well be right. And yeah. So I I, I, I don't know what I, I'll have to figure out what to do there. Uh, so I'm hearing that hint does not allow that either. Well, like Ryan said, you do, if you do that, basically, I'll be dis on on a, on a file basis. I'll be disabling. JS hint from actually checking something it should be checking for. Well, it's, it also yeah, that's the catch. Dave could go in and modify JS hint to do a line by line exclusion of anything. It sounds because JS hint is something we can't modify for our own purposes, right? So. Oh yeah, yeah. There is that. Well, I think I mean just just speaking philosophically, I think there's more value in knowing, say, there's a file where you're doing one thing that the linter com complains about, but you know that you're doing it for a reason. You put a comment there that says, this is why I'm doing this. And you see that lint output. You see that lint warning whenever you build. Mm -hmm. um, but that's fine. As, as long as it doesn't fail the build, that lint warning is a reminder, I'm doing this non-standard thing, and I need to remember that. But, but, well, but I mean, if, if you've got it in a lot of places, it can create a lot of cruft, and it makes it hard to actually find legitimate. But it's fine for your own, to, for the times when you run your own unmodified version of JSON. But I think that for automated build, it would make sense to have a completely clean output so that if something unexpected shows up that a person doesn't know and didn't specifically exclude, then we can catch it. Actually, um, 
Steve well, Olmsted in IRC says that he thinks JS Hint will let you disable stuff per function now. So uh, maybe that's something we could look into. Yeah, I, can, I, mean, I, I mean, that's that's my uh, idea. I can definitely look into that. Because personally, I, I want to get rid of all the cruff because it makes it harder to, uh, if you've got, like, a, a terminal full of uh, warnings and you, you know, there may be something in there that you, you didn't see when you scanned that you actually need to look into. So you just want to be able to dial it down so you can see the real stuff that you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'd like to have it, ideally, there are things you know you want to disable. I would like to have warnings output for that. And then that way you have the ability to see the things that you've ignored and say, yes, I still want to continue ignoring that. But not on an everyday basis, necessarily. And then when there is an actual error to fail, I don't want that. That's my ideal. I don't. I don't want. I don't want people to ignore things and then just forget about them forever and ever. I think it's worth having a way to revisit them. Right. Because eventually you just you'll you'll just start being having blindness to all those warnings and never back and fix them or come back and revisit. Well, that's what I think you get when you have a bunch of warnings that are. That's what I'm saying is that it's configurable so that on a daily basis maybe you turn off warnings. Oh, oh, okay. And only yeah. see errors. Right, yeah, yeah, that's all I'm concerned about. Yeah, I'd like to be able to turn And every off. once in a while you go back in and you look at the warnings and be like, oh, yes, I did bet every single one of these. All right, so that's that. Um, I think it's worth looking into. I think, it, I, I think it's a worthy goal and can potentially be achievable, so I'm just going to try it. I, but I, do, I think 100% code coverage is, uh, should take precedence. Yeah. Well, it's going to make things easier as we open up the gallery to have an automated process that um, does the lint and have you get a badge if you have no lint errors. Um, if we can have a tool that is reasonable enough to, to set the standard and use that tool, then that's just going to make the whole process a lot easier. I think this is a good candidate you mentioned before where there are uh, self-contained tasks like bugs that we can offer to the community. This is another example of that where you can say, go attack you know, this file and make sure it's lint free and keep going. That would be another example. Of but I, I don't want somebody making my file lint free because uh, they don't know the context and, and, and neither does lint. Well, nobody can check in code that they've reviewed and being. No, no. So maybe you don't put your code up for community yeah. assignment. But there are your, plenty your, of... your linty file should have comments at every place where it fails lint that says, this is why I'm doing this. And... Yeah. Right. Well, that's... Oh, that's true. If I even if, even if, yeah, even if I just put an inline comment there, that would, uh, yeah. So don't yeah, just that. so future editors, you know, if you get hit by a bus, somebody else doesn't come along. And yeah, that should, that should be in there anyway. Actually. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. And so the tool, my ideal tool, would use that comment to emit a warning instead of an error. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not getting the lint error. I'm just getting a, I'm getting a warning, and I, 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 it gets in the way of seeing if there's any lint errors. Right, so that should be configurable. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a good point, Ryan, because I, actually if you are breaking convention, so to speak, it should be commented so nobody goes and changes it. Yeah. For that one in a million chance that someone actually well, passes a new string <laughs> object in the charts. We already had an example of this. was trying to do some changes and Eric came back and said, no, no, I really want it to be this way. So it would be nice if he had, you know, included the comments in there so he wouldn't have run back and said. Yeah, very good. That's in, that's in the contributor standards or whatever. It's good, good comment in code. I should actually Tony, do you remember the, the case that happened that, that was about? Yeah, I was setting um, parameter default values uh, with using um, like the parameter name or, or and then parentheses the parameter name is equal to the default value. And yeah. that fails JS hint uh, as opposed to doing an if or the that's parameter uh, equal to there, there is a setting that you can change to disable that warning, because that's a pattern that I use all the time, too, because yeah. it's a really handy pattern. Um. Uh, okay, so um, we're going to move on. Any final thoughts before we do so? Last item up is widget pop-up. 
overview. So I'm going to let Tony drive this one. Yeah, so the, um, the idea behind this is that there's a lot of talk in the community about having the, the calendar as a pop-up module um, or having pop-up abilities to it, but calendar isn't the only widget um, that, could, that could benefit from having something like this. So the idea is to have a generic or an abstracted module that provides any widget with a pop-up uh, modal ability. And uh, so that the uh, wiki page that's created, that's linked there, is generally just a, uh, like a brain dump uh, from Hatch and I earlier today. Um, with like the three options, the three conceivable options where it's, um, it's an object that you specify which widget you want to be rendered inside of the pop-up. Another one is a plugin onto the widget that adds that functionality. And then the other the third option was a mix in where just including it or using it would be the uh, would actually <laughs> augment widget to allow pop up functionality where you would just pass that into the configuration. Uh, so just basically trying to brainstorm how it should be architected. So anybody who has any thoughts on that, uh, please feel free to make comments or edit the page, jump into IRC and talk to us. Um, but what the, the thing that I'm wanting to solve is the ability to have a pop-up calendar, um, a, a pop-up color picker whenever there's a color picker, picker widget available, whether it's in the gallery or the core, um, a volume slider for if it's hidden behind a volume button, uh, anything like that that you, you would click on a button to show another widget in a pop-up type setting. Remember the conversation with the calendar, you said that this was already solved with Modality or something? Um, not, you, I, I don't know if it's a universal solution. I think the, the conversation here is for a universal solution. So I think Hatch specifically used Telos Modality tools and extensions to create the pop-up calendar um, that is currently in the gallery. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the solutions that Tilo built are useful for this purpose. I imagine that what you want to do is do something more universal in terms of, you know, figuring out how to create a trigger for a pop-up and make it go away and what makes it go away and where does it pass the data, sort of that whole flow, right? So like with calendar, for example, it's triggered by an input field or a click on a button and then some data from the calendar is retrieved at the end when it's uh, hidden again. Um, and so I think the question is how is that process sort of approached universally and is it worth including that into the, the whole pop-up uh, infrastructure that you're building out? Right. The, uh, the current one that Hatch has in the gallery. Sorry, go ahead. The current one that Hatch has in the gallery actually extends calendar and mixes in the, the modality features. Right. Uh, and so this would be something that would do something very similar to that, if that's the correct approach, is mixing in to the widget uh, without actually, with just augmenting the, the instance level, uh, without augmenting the actual global widget namespace. I see. So without extending the actual. Um, okay. Anyway, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the the solution would definitely rely on the on the modality extensions on the widget modality that Tilo built. It's just a matter of uh, how and to what extent and and what the other pieces are for passing the data back and forth and triggering uh, the the pop up dialog. So yeah, that's. I mean, it sounds like. A lot of the work is already done, just needs to be uh, structured in some reason. It, it sounds to me like, um, so, so there are two limitations that I see. One is um, why, why limit this to widgets? You know, this could be useful for views or it could be useful for um, even just nodes on a page. Uh, and then the other the other one is um, the it looks like the hide on and show on events right now are limited to events on nodes. But what if I wanted to 
hide or show a pop-up based on a history event or uh, based on a route being triggered in a router or something like that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That That's kind of the the way that I was thinking that hide on and show on would work is that uh, it would be more of a target source, whether it's an object or a node, or anything that you can subscribe an event to, and uh, and then the type of event that it would be subscribed to, and that could just that could be an array of object pairs, or just an object that's paired out, or some combination uh, of both. So if you had a node but you wanted any event or focus and blur events to trigger something. Uh, and the idea be behind it being a plugin would be that anything that's a plugin host, whether it's a model or view or any other plugin host that could possibly be on the page, then it could be plugged into that and that functionality would just in surround or encapsulate the whatever the plugin host is. Okay. So that's that's kind of I'm leaning more towards the idea of it being a plugin because it's less uh, augmentation that's going on, and it might be yeah. a cleaner approach for the overall view. But uh, yeah, that that seems like it makes sense to me. Um, the I don't quite get the the container version, and and having it as a as an extension seems kind of weird because I don't really see a case where you would want every instance of a widget on a page to be a pop up. That seems kind of weird. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, like, so that's at first I was thinking the the container thing and Hatch, I uh, believe, brought up the idea of it being an extension uh, for the simple yep. fact that you could cool. extend, you could extend all widgets or add the functionality to any widget type instance of the page. Mm -hmm. Juan is voicing his opinion on IRC, saying that he's voting for the plugin style versus the extension style. Plus one. I, I guess I can. I mean, I can. I can kind of see a case. Like, if I were developing a widget specifically to be a pop-up, and I wanted to use this functionality, then I could see the extension being useful. Yeah, I mean, but if you wanted it to be um, a pop-up uh, pop all the time, you could plug it in internally under the hood. Yeah, you could. I guess I can think of one instance where I might like a visual container behind something. Say you were popping up a slider that uh, might be visually interfered, you know, by whatever's in the background. You might want to have a container that has an opaque background to it. But photo galleries, light box. Yeah. Yeah. So the the idea with the uh, with the extension was that just by simply including it on the page um, would give you the uh, the pop-up functionality on all widgets that are on the page. Um, so that of course is going to incur some costs but it makes it very easy for anyone to take any widget that's on the page and simply make it pop up. I guess my reservation about that is just why would that be more useful than saying here is the widget that I want to turn into a pop-up, plug this thing into it. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's very true. So or if you want something right. besides a widget with that functionality. Yeah. So then, assuming we're converging on option number two, yeah. uh, I would think that the hiding and showing is itself an interesting moment. So is that subscribable or observable? Well, widgets inherently have a visibility attribute, and you can listen for um, for visible change. For for other things, for for a view or for a node or for something that's not a widget, um, I think that would have to be left up to whatever that thing is. Is that true, or should the pop up provide a common API for that? I'm thinking that the pop up should provide a common API for that. It can then hook into the, the the widget stuff, and then if it is if it's not a widget, it could then um, create its own um, events for that. Well, if the, if there's the ability to fire an event from the plugin host wherever it's plugged into, then that would be the route that I would suggest taking, because then you're listening for the event to be subscribed on the host, and not 
the instance of the plugin itself. Mm. Um, it, well, it seems like even in the widget case, the pop-up would have to expose its own events, and and you would use those instead of instead of listening for visible change. Right. Um, if if it wants to ensure that it works in all cases, whether it's a widget or a, just a, a base class of some kind. Yeah, what I'm wondering is if if you had a widget um, popping up, would you want to listen to the widget visibility change or would you listen to the pop-up change? And uh, just quickly thinking about it here, I would probably want to listen to just the pop-up change because if the pop-up's up, you can generally assume that the widget is also in there. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't I know if I would want to override the, the widget's visibility change. Um, because you could have some other code that's depending on that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it probably also makes sense to keep those um, to keep those events self-contained in the plugin, just so you don't have unexpected behavior on with a conflict on on the class that it's being plugged into. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's why I was thinking that if you have the ability to to publish on an event onto the host. And then unpublish the event onto the host if the plugin was ever unplugged. Well, I don't. I don't think you would want to do that, though. I. I think because the the trick is you don't know if that if you if you publish a pop up event. Um, uh, so it, it would basically know. be uh, what widget dot pop up dot on or after and listen to the event that way. Yeah, but that that seems to violate the concept of a plugin. the The idea of a plugin is is the plugin. Does its stuff within its own plugin namespace, so you'd have widget dot plugin namespace dot whatever, um, and that's where the plugin's methods live. That's where its events are subscribed, um, and and that keeps it separate from whatever it's being plugged into, so that it can be more generic. It can be more. Um, you have a separation of concerns there, and I think if the plugin decides to start publishing and firing events on the widget on on its host, um, I mean, there's more of a chance for for collisions, there's there's more of a chance for. I guess it, it just feels kind of wrong that violation of the separation of concerns. Plus the unplugging of other parts depends on that plugin's behavior, and that plugin goes away, then it might break. Well, then the events would just never fire on the host, and nothing would ever happen. Yeah, but I don't know. That's a slippery slope. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to see. Lots of other places in the library have plugins that start modifying their hosts. I think it would be okay for a, for a plugin to bubble an event to its host, but I don't think I would want a plugin to publish on the host. Yeah, I mean, bubbling would be fine too. Like, I'm just trying to think of how the implementation would be simplified if it was if you were able to listen to the pop-up events off of the host element versus having to add in the Pop up means. I, mean, I really think the only difference is you you don't have to include the the, the plugin's namespace when you attach an event, so it oh, okay. saves you a little bit of typing. But yeah, if that's the only benefit, then it's not really separation there because that way you keep your plugins all the same. They're all first class citizens, and you, you can have that confidence that when you remove it or its behavior is the same, it's going to work in the same. Yeah, yeah. I I can't think of any plugins in the library right now that actually expose events on their hosts. I think they're all self-contained like that. I could be wrong, but I, nothing comes to mind. So I guess to recap here, um, the hide on would and show on events would be pretty much anything that can be listened to. Um, and that the events should bubble up through its host. And it should work on not just widgets, but on nodes and other things as well. Yeah, any plugin host. Anything could be plugged in. I think that makes sense. Um, it's handy because you can do other website, you know, you get a call outs or some sidebars or things like that that come in. It might be useful for mobile too, for hiding menus and things that you want to bring in. Oh uh, yeah, if you had navigation, then you could you could just plug in the navigation whenever it gets to a, a mobile size or a a small viewport, and then unplug it whenever it expands out. That'd be pretty pretty nice, I think. Any 
other comments? All right, guys, should we call it a day? Thank you, everyone. Yeah. We will see you on the new mailing list and next week. Right. See, you. see you guys. Bye. See you. Bye. See you.